Hello, my name is uh, Rob Murphy, and I'm the executive director of the Havey Institute for Global Health and the John Philip Baer Professor of Infectious Diseases and Professor of Biomedical Engineering here at Northwestern University. Uh, thank you very much for uh, taking the time to join us this afternoon for our latest installment of the Havey Institute for Global Health uh, uh, seminar series. Today's uh, topic is the, or today's, the title of today's uh, uh, talk is the significance of statistical insignificance, COVID-19 and the social, medical, and statistical ends to the pandemic. Um, this is going to be given by Alex Lundberg, who I introduce in just a second. Please take a moment to follow us on Facebook, uh, as well as Twitter and our, our X and our newly launched Instagram page at uh, hashtag FSM Global Health. In addition, we welcome you to become an Institute member, which is very simple to do, it takes about two minutes to receive access to specialized resources and services that support research infrastructure. For more information, please visit our website at globalhealth.northwestern.edu backslash members. Today, we're really happy to have Alex Lundberg, PhD, join us. Alex is an applied microeconomist trained in statistical methods. Uh, he received his PhD from Emory before uh, joining us uh, in the fall of 2021 as a team scientist in the Department of Emergency Medicine. He's also a member of the Bueller Center for Health Policy and Economics uh, and the Institute for Global Health. His research centers on SARS-CoV-2, substance use, uh, injury, and the criminal justice system. He has published work in the Journal of Applied Econom Econometrics, Advances in Econometrics, the Journal of Quantitative Criminology, and JAMA Network Open. There will be time for questions following the presentation, but we welcome you to submit your questions to the Q&A feature that you see at the bottom of your screen. Not the chat box, but the specific Q&A feature. You can put your question in there at any time. Um, and uh, following the end of his presentation, Dr. Lori Post uh, will be handling the uh, Q&A part. So feel free to put your questions in at any time. So now, uh, thank you all again. And thank you, Alex, for joining us. Take it away. I turn it uh, over to you. Thank you so much for the introduction, Rob. And uh, thank you all for being here and for the opportunity to present. Uh, I'm going to share my screen here. And let me know if that does not go OK. Uh, it's up. I don't think it's in presentation mode, though. There we go. OK, great. Thank there you. There we go. Thank you. Um, so I also want to say thank you to Lori Post, who have worked closely with this, as well as a number of members of um, Northwestern and the Institute for Global Health. I'm pretty excited today to talk about some of our recent work on, on COVID-19 around the end of the pandemic, and how do we know if and when a pandemic ends? So one difficulty is that we have no single agency to pinpoint the start and end of pandemics. Uh, I am an economist, so when I think about the identification of a recession or ex an expansion in the economy, uh, it's kind of nice we can turn to an agency like the National Bureau of Economic Research in the US. Uh, in the European Union, we have an agency within the European uh, Central Bank Research Network that identifies the start and end dates of recessions. Um, but when it comes to the pandemic, we don't have that kind of proclamation that's really coming from any kind of agency. Uh, field epidemiology does not have a ready definition for the end of a pandemic. Now, you've probably been following some of the more recent declarations that the pandemic seems to be over. Most of these seem to come through emergency uh, status removals. Probably the most wide reaching of these is, of course, the uh, the World Health Organization's declaration that COVID-19 is no longer a public health emergency of international concern as of May 5th this year. In response to this decision, some scholars did uh, put forward some criticism about the subjective nature of the decision. Of course, subjective does not mean arbitrary. Uh, the World Health Organization looked at a number of indicators like mortality and hospitalization rates to arrive at this conclusion. But we don't have a, a bright line statistical metric to be able to say, this is it, the pandemic is over. So our question here is, is the end of this emergency status the effective end of the pandemic? And of course, not completely. Uh, 
World Health Organization still considers COVID a global threat, right? We still do have uh, a number of infections and deaths around the world, but is this the tail end of the pandemic? Now, pandemics often arrive in kind of a dramatic culmination, but typically they wane slowly as society adapts to a novel pathogen. This slow resumption of normal social life uh, puts forward potentially multiple ends to a pandemic. One is what we might think of foremost, the medical end. That means that uh, the public health threat of the pathogen is well contained. Uh, maybe we have something like RSV where there is a health risk, but we don't consider it to be such a global threat that we take uh, socio-political action around it. Um, now, another potential end of the pandemic is the social end. Uh, I'm going to use that as a shorthand to really describe socio-political end. At some point, historically, people get tired. They get pandemic fatigue. They want to get back into their normal routines of life. And eventually, people say, whether or not the medical end has arrived, we are at a social end where our behavior is going back to the way it was before the pandemic started. Now, in this work, we're introducing a third potential end, which is the statistical end. We think of this as a way to identify the medical end to a pandemic. And I'll get to these criteria in a little bit, but we'll put, put forward three criteria that should be supported if we are at the end statistically of a pandemic. So I'll just give some very basic overview here because we've got a lot to get through and I wanna leave time for the Q&A. As we all know, the COVID-19 pandemic has reshaped modern life. Uh, we are at approximately 7 million global deaths now. Uh, this metric of confirmed cases of 750 million is very much an underestimate. Uh, these are only confirmed cases even back in the fall of 2022. Uh, we had studies that estimated about 60% of the world population had antibodies uh, for the virus, whether that be from vaccination or, or, or from infection. Uh, there have been dramatic social disruptions. Uh, the World Health Organization has estimated an increase of 25% in global prevalence of anxiety depression. Um, from my perspective as an economist, one of the more worrisome long-term impacts of this, too, is... Uh, the, the impact on education. And we have seen that there's been a 13 percentage point increase in learning poverty in low and middle income countries. Uh, economically, we've had big impacts. These have um, varied by economic development. Um, you can see that middle income in countries were impacted the most in terms of GDP growth hits. Uh, in low income countries were affected the least. Um, I would not take this to mean, though, that the, the impact of the pandemic was worse for uh, more advanced economies. Really, this is more a matter of, in a low-income country, there is not as much to contract as there is in a higher-income country. Uh, of course, there have been some good things to come out of the pandemic. The, uh, the rapid international collaboration to create vaccines it's really a humanitarian victory. Uh, some of the technologies there from mRNA uh, hold promise for other infection diseases and even cancer. Uh, more generally, COVID did create a natural experiment that spurred research uh, across many different fields. One of which, for example, is, is climate change. We saw a, a temporary significant reduction in air pollution as, as lockdowns uh, spread across the world. Although, to my knowledge, the news from some of those studies is somewhat depressing in that we've seen some irreversible effects of climate change that continued even though we had a disruption in the air pollution for a, for a time. And we saw increases in uh, telehealth, telemedicine, and work from home. Now, I'm going to focus in this talk about the World Health Organization declaration, but world leaders had begun to declare the end to the pandemic much earlier. Uh, the European Commission ended the emergency status of COVID-19 in April of 2022, 
Uh, the Brazilian Ministry of Health issued a similar proclamation around the same time. Uh, in September 2022, U.S. President Joe Biden declared that the pandemic was over uh, in a 60 Minutes interview. It wouldn't be later until April 2023 that we announced that we would certainly formally exit the emergency status uh, in May, shortly after the, uh, the World Health Organization declaration. So, you know, as these emergency statuses fall across the world, kind of the immediate question is, well, how do we, will we know when the pandemic is over? So let's pick on Joe Biden for a little bit here. In mid-September of uh, 2022, he said that the pandemic was over. Now, this chart shows you smoothed new cases globally of COVID-19. And we can see that from that point on, maybe it looked like the pandemic was over, but then we saw a huge explosion in, in global cases. Now, to Biden's credit, Presumably, he was focused on the United States and not the world when he made this uh, declaration. But clearly, from a global perspective, the pandemic was not over. And when we think about that dramatic spike around the end of 2022, start of 2023, that is driven primarily by the, the Omicron waves that had a delayed effect in China and in the region of East Asia. Uh, one of the bigger stories through the pandemic was that China was able to effectively control COVID through its zero COVID policies. Uh, but when those policies were abandoned, then the Omicron waves finally hit in force. So what is a pandemic, of course? Well, the word pandemic was first used in text print in 1666 in England uh, around a resurgence of the bubonic plague. At that time, the term was used synonymously with endemic. In more modern definitions, we might think of an outbreak as a sudden increase of disease in a concentrated setting. An epidemic is a sudden increase in a, in a broader setting within a population or within a region. A pandemic is when we have a spread across different countries and different continents. And finally, endemic is a state where we have a continued presence of the disease without sudden changes in cases. So when we talk about the statistical end to the pandemic, we are trying to identify this transition from a pandemic to endemic. Now, I should say, these are broad definitions I put forward here. There's not a consensus within epidemiology about the exact terms here, but I think that this categorization helps us think about the stages uh, of a pandemic. But a little bit more historical context. Uh, this table shows a list of recent pandemics, starting with the COVID-19, proceeding chronologically backwards through Ebola, swine flu, SARS, HIV, um, the Spanish flu, and cholera. Uh, we, of course, when we say the pandemic now, our mind goes to COVID-19, but many experts argue that we are still in other pandemics, uh, specifically HIV, as well as uh, potentially cholera with the seventh wave of infections that has been going on for, for really decades. So I mentioned this before, we've got this distinction between a social and medical end. At some point, people lose fear about the pathogen. They want to return to normal life. Probably the best analog to the COVID-19 pandemic that we have in recent history was the Spanish flu uh, in 1918 to 1919, 1920. Uh, experts would argue that there are either three or four waves of infections over that two to three year period. However, in studies of excess mortality, uh, excess deaths in the United States um, here uh, might have been 30K uh, even 100K a few years after this period. So this seems like a case where the social end presumably preceded the medical end to the Spanish flu pandemic, at least within the United States. Uh, and we see a lot of analogs as to today with uh, COVID where people responded, 
protested some of the lockdowns, public health measures to reduce transmissions. Um, and for example, in San Francisco in 1919, a, a group of two to 4,000 people formed an anti-mask league because of uh, their objection to a second round of mask mandates within the area. Around the world, public health responses to COVID-19 are varied and responses to those public health responses have varied. Uh, just picking out a few examples here, uh, we saw protests, I, I wanna say in every global region around the world, uh, for example, in, in Cyprus, there were lockdowns and protests that led to confrontations with police. Uh, in the Philippines, uh, President Duterte, in fact, issued a shoot-to-kill order against protesters who, who might have violated lockdowns. Uh, but maybe the best example of a social end to the pandemic preceding the medical end in, in COVID-19 is uh, China's zero COVID policy. At the end of 2022, there were large national protests uh, where people wanted to end some very austere measures to contain the virus, uh, measures that were very effective and really did limit COVID transmissions in China and as a consequence throughout the region. Um, now, the decision to abandon zero COVID may not have been caused exclusively by these protests, but experts do believe that these were a contributing factor. Uh, when we saw the policy abandoned, then we saw finally the Omicron outbreak hit China in force. And that is what drove that huge spike that we saw in the figure before of uh, after Biden's declaration that the pandemic was over. I wanted to put this figure together because I think one of the more interesting um, policy instruments that came out of pandemic research was headed by a group of researchers from Oxford who created a stringency index, which was a measure of the strength of government regulations in response to, to COVID-19. Here is just a sample of six countries in Latin America, and you can see that different countries had very different responses throughout the course of the pandemic. For example, if you look at Nicaragua, the scale is actually different. Um, there, the austerity measure really only goes up to 20 compared to 80 for the other countries. Uh, and in Nicaragua, although nominally a democracy largely functions as uh, a dictatorship, um, there were really hardly any measures taken to, to combat COVID. In other countries, you might see a pattern where they took strong initial measures and then immediately relaxed them. In others, you see more waves of measures and responses to waves of outbreaks. Uh, but I, I like this measure, even though it is imperfect um, because of the scale, but it really does a good job showing around the world how different communities and different countries have responded to, to the virus. So with that background in mind, why is it that field epidemiology did not have a prepackaged definition for the statistical end to a pandemic? Put forward a few potential explanations here. Uh, one could be, well, every pandemic is different. And should we use the same definitions of an outbreak, pandemic, endemic for every disease? You might think of HIV with different transmission mechanisms than SARS-CoV-2. Um, you know, it, it may not be clear that we really should use the same exact definition for every different type of pathogen. One of the constraints that we do see, of course, is that data were sparse. When I cited some studies on the Spanish flu, we had to look at more excess mortality because we didn't have the testing capacity for uh, different types of uh, viruses that we do today. As an example, the uh, Global Initiative on Sharing All Influenza Data launched in 2008. With our team here over the last few years, we have consulted these data on you know, a daily, weekly basis. They've been extremely useful, uh, but this type of widespread uh, specimen testing was just not available for research and, until more recently. And another point is that 
you know, as I've aged, I get more and more of a sense of how young the world really is. And the field of statistics is still a very young field. Um, look at one of the most influential publications in the field was Ronald Fisher's Statistical Methods for Research Workers. Uh, came out in 1925. And that work is largely credited for the popularization of uh, p-values and the 0.05 significance threshold that seems ubiquitous uh, in medical research and research across many different uh, interdisciplinary fields. Uh, because I think some of these biographies and history are interesting. I put one slide on Ronald Fisher as well. Uh, often considered the father of modern statistics, Ronald Fisher had uh, he had an enormous impact on the field. Uh, he proposed the idea of maximum likelihood estimation, analysis of variance, he popularized the t-distribution with William Gossett. Uh, the f distribution is named after him. You know, it's it's impossible really to overstate the impact that he had on the field. He did still leave a complicated legacy. Uh, he had very much elitist ideas. He noticed that people in upper social classes tended to have lower fertility rates than people in lower social classes. Uh, and he was a strong proponent, proponent of eugenics, uh, helped form the Cambridge Eugenics Society. Um, and kind of in an interesting statistical failure, he very much opposed the mounting evidence that smoking was uh, a strong cancer risk for lung cancer and other types of cancer. Uh, he mentioned that the danger of smoking was not the mild and soothing weed, but the organized creation of states of frantic alarm. Now, it's kind of remarkable given how much work he did on dealing with statistical confounding and randomization. Uh, but some people argue this was a measure uh, an example of confirmation bias. He was an avid smoker himself. Uh, you know, he put so forward some interesting but probably tenuous arguments about reverse causality in cancer, citing that perhaps people with chronic inflammation felt the need to alleviate the symptoms with smoking. And really, those chronic inflammation issues what were what was causing the cancer, and it wasn't the smoking itself. Um, so no doubt a fantastic and brilliant mind, uh, a huge impact on the field and statistics, but still with that kind of complicated legacy. Uh, so with the advent of modern statistics, we are proposing that to identify the statistical end to a pandemic, we should see three criteria satisfied. One is that the daily rate of new cases should hover near zero. We should at some point be past the gigantic outbreaks that we've seen across the world and end up in a more stable, low-level pattern of new cases. We also say that the stability should be maintained over multiple disease rep reproduction cycles. Uh, we don't want it to be that cases are low, but there's a long incubation period, and then a week later, suddenly we see another massive outbreak. And third, we should have that statistical tests for outbreak status yield consistently insignificant outcomes. So let's see whether these criteria were met around the time of the WHO declaration. Uh, I'm gonna show you some data that are separated by global region. We have adopted the World Bank definition of global regions but we have separated out in North America, USA, and Canada. So this figure plots the weekly rate of new COVID-19 cases per 100,000 population over time. And you can see in terms of peak speed, the USA, Europe, eventually East Asia and Pacific had the most significant outbreaks, and those were uh, largely driven by Omicron. Uh, in other parts of the world, we we saw speed significantly eclipse the outbreak threshold that we have adopted from the CDC of 10 cases per 100K per week. But different regions have fared very differently in terms of overall disease burden. 
Most recently, though, you might notice this gray dashed line, which is that threshold of 10 uh, cases per 100,000 population, has been above the weekly rate of new COVID-19 cases for every global region for, for weeks. And this goes up to May 12th, the week after the WHO declaration of May 5th. So certainly looking at a picture like this, it looks like we might be at the end game. Now, we mentioned here, uh, I got a question about what would be an outbreak then. Um, you know, let me just skip ahead and I'll skip back for a second. We have adopted a convention by the CDC, which is that any transmission over 10 per 100,000 population per week could be considered moderate or outbreak status. Uh, to get to a substantial rate of new transmissions, we would be need to achieve 50 per week. Uh, and to achieve a high rate of, you know, most serious outbreak, that would be 100 or more per week. And I will say, too, when we held meetings with um, the CDC, Biden's task force, a number of researchers, you know, we, we adopted that convention of 10 and we jumped on really the bandwagon. Everybody else had used this, this definition. Uh, they seemed completely comfortable with this. So we, we also decided we, we should use the same threshold. Uh, so for this outbreak status, then we need some kind of statistical test for whether regions, the world are actually in an outbreak or not. Initially, I thought about using some type of non-parametric trend test, um, but with the kind of ebb and flow fluctuations we tend to see with cases, that was a very noisy procedure. Ultimately, we settled on a really simple approach, which is let's run a one-sided t-test for whether speed is equal to 10 or greater than 10 for a given region. And we calculated this test on a rolling window of six months of data. We gathered the p-values from these tests and plotted them over time. And the argument here is, if we have been out of outbreak status to where the threat seems to have diminished, it should be that we start to see insignificant statistically results. Um, and now I'm going to go through uh, this test, the p-values rolling window for uh, regions around the world. First, we break up the North America with the USA and Canada again. And you can see that now in this figure, the gray dashed line is not the same thing as before. This is the most generous conventional threshold for st uh, statistical significance of 0 0.1. And for the entire course of the pandemic, this test strongly rejected that the US uh, had a rate of novel transmissions of 10 or below until very recently. You know, I think this was like either end of April, mid-April, I can't remember the exact time that this crossed the threshold, but it wasn't until recently that we saw for the US, we failed finally to reject this null hypothesis, that speed was equal to or greater than 10. And furthermore, we've gone up to complete significant insignificance of a p-value close to one. Now, if you look at some other parts of the world, here's Canada. Largely, Canada's rate of new transmissions mirrored the U.S., but the magnitude was significantly lower. So initially, we did see insignificance, and in some of the bigger outbreaks driven by uh, Delta and Omicron variants, we then rejected the null hypothesis that said, yes, we are in an outbreak status. More recently, we've gone back to that complete significance and Canada has been there for much longer than the, the United States. Now, uh, we've got Europe. So I'm trying to move this Zoom menu on the top so I can see which region I'm looking at. Um, in Europe, we had a trend that looked a lot like the United States. It was rejected, rejected the entire time. We're in outbreak status until recently, end of April, start of May. 
uh, in Latin America, you see a different story. Latin America was hit very hard early on by COVID. Um, still an overall disease burden. One of the harder regions that was hit across the world were up to uh, around a, over one and a half million deaths for Latin America now. Um, but in the initial period of the pandemic, we rejected the null, right? We were in an outbreak, started to get better until we had Omicron come through again. Uh, and this is a rolling window. So you know, you're not gonna see this exactly match up to the peak speed of an outbreak, but it's, it's more to give a sense of trends over time. And then more lately, we've seen the significance uh, of this test go completely away as well. Um, in Central Asia, we had a little different story where, okay, rejected for a while, started to become insignificant. Um, then we saw some outbreaks. Part of these were driven, you know, presumably by the, the military conflict, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, it wasn't until recently that we finally see insignificance again for the region. Now, again, this does come with a caveat with the public health infrastructure um, damaged within the war. Uh, with, you know, it, we do have to accept that there probably are some data limitations here, probably some underreports of overall counts. Uh, but we still do believe that in spite of that bias, COVID-19 appears to be relatively well contained in the region. Uh, for South Asia, we have a different story. You know, we almost barely got away from complete insignificance. In South Asia, there were a couple points where we eclipsed that informal threshold for um, outbreak status of 10. Uh, but even those outbreaks were just short, low peak speed. Uh, never really hit the kind of outbreaks that we saw in North America and Europe and other parts of the world. Um, actually, I'm going to squ switch to uh, Sub-Saharan Africa first because this is another similar situation where in Sub-Saharan Africa, we just have complete significant insignificance for the entire pandemic. Again, you might think of data reporting. Uh, maybe is this a, a product of testing capacity? Uh, we don't believe that's true. Testing capacity, to my knowledge, is pretty good in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, not that capacity building has been an unmitigated success in every case, in every country, but uh, for a couple reasons, testing actually has been quite good in the area. One is that it ramped up in response to COVID. The other is that the region has dealt with uh, other types of infectious disease for a long time, and so had some infrastructure in place to be able to uh, accommodate testing for the SARS-CoV-2 virus as well. So you know, it's, it's kind of a something of a mystery to why South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa fared so well in the pandemic. Maybe a little bit of that, that is data reporting, um, but there are a, a number of factors that probably do have an influence. Uh, one, demographically, these are very young areas. Um, Two, it may have to do with climate change. In Sub-Saharan Africa, there's you know, some hypotheses out there that exposure to uh, so many of the other types of infectious disease may have offered kind of a stronger immunity pr protection for, for COVID as well. Um, but to our knowledge, that is still a mystery that is not completely resolved yet. Um, in Middle East and North Africa, we saw um, slight different progression insignificance to start. There were a couple outbreaks in the region. Uh, you know, for once we, we did reject the null to say we are an outbreak status around the, loosely speaking, the Delta Omicron uh, Delta time. The Omicron outbreaks were not as pronounced in the region so that we did not go back to reject this test uh, at that time. And then we've been in a period of insignificance ever since. Um, one of the more interesting stories, again, was this East Asia and the Pacific. Uh, we had it, total insignificance for the longest time. This is largely because of the, the effective uh, Chinese zero COVID policy. Finally, when that policy was abandoned, 
we rejected this null. We saw a very massive Omicron outbreak. Um, only until recently have we seen that this outbreak status is almost insignificant. So for this region, um, the, you know, if you use a 0 0.05 threshold, okay, yeah, we're not insignificant anymore, but East Asia was kind of the last domino to fall in terms of global regions for our, the biggest outbreaks. Um, so I've also got a question here about, you know, how do we change, deal with fluctuations in testing? Well, I've got a couple responses there. Um, one is that at some point, we no longer believe we can really rely on the transmission rate data. Uh, that's why we stopped these tests around that period of May 12th, that emergency declaration exit for World Health Organization, as well as the United States, uh, because we have seen such a shift to different types of testing, also just not reporting tests. Um, right now, the CDC in the U.S. has shifted to hospitalizations and death as its primary metrics. Um, we do have some. Now, this simple t-test, we like for the simplicity of it. This does not account for fluctuations in something like testing capacity or testing reports. Uh, we do have uh, a different measure. And apologies, this, I meant to go over this first, but then I switched order where we also wanted to look at the, the propagation of disease over reproduction cycles. Now, for COVID-19, in, in, in our kind of core team here, we tend not to see a lot of value in the basic reproduction number, or not. Um, of course, others may disagree, but from our position, this is a, a number that changes frequently. It, the virus evolves very frequently. Um, that affects are not, you know, it changes by region, it changes by other factors and, you know, demographics as well as mitigation measures, lockdowns, mask mandates. So instead, we had uh, adapted a tool that was created in economics to measure um, the persistence or an, a forward echo effect of the statistical prediction of new COVID cases today on cases tomorrow or next week. To do that, we adapted an implementation of the Arellano Bond dynamic panel model. Now, in a model like this, you've got a dependent variable. This is going to be your rate of new cases. I is an index for a country, or in some cases, it might be a state or a, a province, and T is a point in time. Now, this method was an advance statistically because it allowed for unit-specific controls. If you're familiar with longitudinal data and analysis, um, one of the big benefits of having repeated observations of the same unit over time, could be same person, same country, is that we can, can control for unit-specific effects, things that don't change over time. You know, for an individual person, that might be something like genetics or childhood experiences that happened in the past. Uh, for a country, it might be something like geography or climate that doesn't change potentially over the pandemic. Um, and this method was a way to get consistent estimates for these coefficients in spite of the dynamics, which actually create a very difficult statistical problem to solve in, in correlation between the error term and your covariates that cause bias in your estimates. Um, now, of course, Erlano Bond get all the credit. Really, the mechanics of this estimator were put forward by Anderson and Shao in 1982. Uh, but I also wanted to cite this to show that you know, it, it, we do have a huge amount of advances in science recently, right? Statistics, economics, econometrics have all come a, a long way over the last 100 years. So in using this, what we created was uh, a statistical estimate of that coefficient, how well do cases today predict cases tomorrow or next week? Um, now, what does it mean to exist over multiple reproduction cycles? Well, from a pooled estimate from 90 studies, we had that initially the, the mean incubation period 
the time between um, contracting COVID-19 and, and showing symptoms was estimated to be about six days. That incubation period fell for Omicron to be about below, you know, potentially three days. And what we did is then also plotted this persistence measure, which is that coefficient estimate. It is not a perfect correlate, but it does tend to follow transmission patterns uh, for the raw data of, of, of new cases. And you can also see that towards the end of April, May, that was the first time that we uh, did see all of these estimates go down for every region in the world. Now, no data method will be perfect. This method, however, does a better job in accounting for differences in testing capacity um, in different reporting capacity that might vary also by country for a couple reasons. One is that we have those unit specific controls. So it might be that maybe Nicaragua doesn't have as much testing capacity as maybe uh, Denmark does. And we can control for the, that difference to the extent it doesn't change. Furthermore, we can also include covariates in there, like uh, how many tests were conducted and reported to public health agencies. And so when we, we validated this measure, we, we included a set of covariates for testing capacity to, to account for those changes over time. Um, but to kind of summarize again, for the first time, rates across every region of the, uh, of the world have fallen below threshold status. Our persistent measure, this propagation effect statistically, really for the first time has looked low and stable for, for every region. Um, and the, the series of these simple t-tests for outbreak status have finally all returned in significance with the marginal exception of East Asia and Pacific at the time of, of early May. So um, our conclusion would be by these metrics, we do think this is the statistical end of the pandemic. Again, we've got a question here. The biggest limitation is the frequency and quality of data reports. Um, as we got into April and May, we had to deal with a lot of changes in data quality. Um, one was that a number of countries switched reports from daily to weekly reports, and we had to find ways to incorporate that or smooth or interpolate it daily. Um, another big factor is that people switched from PCR tests to at-home antigen tests. And you know most people probably do not report these to public health agencies. You know, I personally, I've done that too, and I have not reported it. I like to think that I made a sincere effort around all the, the measures around COVID for public safety, but this is the distinction between the social and medical and end. People are human and imperfect, right? At some point where we have pandemic fatigue, we're not going to be as careful as we used to be. So these statistics, they suggest that we have transitioned from pandemic to endemic. Um, if this is correct, and if this transition also signifies the medical end of the pandemic, then we are at the end stage. Kind of elephant in the room would be, is there an epilogue here? Uh, we've heard in the news about uh, a number of new subvariants of Omicron that have appeared throughout the summer. Um, you know, our sense is that, yes, we have, at least in the US, we have seen an uptick in COVID metrics we have abandoned the transmission rate, but the CDC now looks at hospitalizations. We also have wastewater um, data that show right over August, September, we've probably seen about a 28% increase in these indicators. Um, you know, we still believe that this is probably the end stage of the pandemic. Well, yeah, the World Health Organization has looked at Iris as you know, a variant of interest. Uh, the CDC does not have any variants of concern right now. Um, you know, we believe that this is kind of a natural uh, uptick in cases that may be driven by a resumption of travel hitting in force over um, over this summer, as well as returns to school, reductions in 
safety measures as, as the social end to the pandemic concludes as well. Uh, but I wanted to end about 15 minutes early. So let me stop there um, and I'll turn it over to uh, questions. Um, you know, I'm happy to field these, but we also have Lori Post, who's been a PI in this project, who's gonna help out with some of those questions as well. Yeah, please put your questions in the Q&A box and let Lori uh, uh, manage the Q&A part, uh, Alex, because that's going to be a little bit easier with so many right. people. Yeah, thank okay, you. Go ahead, take it away. Thank you for everybody who's attending and thank you for the questions. I'm going to start throwing them at Alex and su submit further ones. So Alex, to start off from Lane Starrett, what would be classified as an outbreak then? One case, 10, 20, is the case level hovering zero feasible? Yes, yeah, so let me say I did. I tried to answer these first two questions while we were going on in the uh, the presentation. Um, the others I haven't gotten to yet. Um, we, I so this is out of my domain to be honest. I don't know exactly how the CDC arrived at these thresholds. We ran with them because everybody that we talked to seemed to use these thresholds, and we said, okay, we're going to use this for COVID as well. Um, because of the heightened transmissibility of COVID, though there is a good question, is hovering below around zero feasible? We think it it probably is. Um, I mean, 10 is a pretty tight threshold. But, you know, it's hard to say exactly with the change in data reports. But if we look at different parts of the region over time, we have seen extended periods where entire global regions you know, basically every country within a region did maintain cases below 10 for an extended period of time. Um, so, yeah, there is the question that as the virus has evolved, we've had much heightened transmissibility. So maybe that threshold should be changed. You know, in my perspective, it would be great to see more epidemiological studies around, you know, what kind of thresholds would should we use for, for different types of pandemics. Okay, um, I'm going to go on. The next question is, in your COVID-19 case data, how do you deal with fluctuations in testing such as shuttering of large-scale testing sites or shifts toward home-based antigen testing and lack of consistent reporting? I think you kind of answered that after this was submitted, but go ahead. Um, yes, yeah, so that is, ultimately, it is a limitation no matter what, right? We would love to have better testing data. PCR tests are more accurate. Um, most importantly, though, when people do at-home tests, they probably do not report it to health agencies. Um, that already was a factor in the end stage of the sample period that I showed you. Um, it, I mean, it is a limitation. We try to answer that to an extent with some of the uh, persistence measures, but ultimately, there is going to be a breakdown at some point in the data. And that is why we stopped in May. Um, okay. So with the next question here, um, I don't why, know that I'll have time to do justice to all yeah. of these. Let me read them out so some people can't see. Okay. So why rely on a one-sided t-test with data aggregated over six months? Aren't several assumptions violated? Independence and thus Degrees of freedom being an obvious one. Um, so that it, it is somewhat arbitrary of over six months. There are, um, yes, with the, the the statistical independence, right? That is a violation. Um, I still think there is something to be learned from this. I think the simplicity is worthy. Now, this is where we wanted to combine three different statistical criteria because no one is going to provide the complete picture, right? This still does do a good job at think of identifying are you in an outbreak status or not. But if you wanna to get to this linkage of one week to the next dependent on the other, that's where we also wanna build in that reproductive cycle and, and add information from the um, from that Arilano bond persistence measure. So yeah, it's not perfect, right? One week to the next, there is going to be correlation within, right? The, the transmission rates—that is true. Okay. Um, 
Thanks. Let me go on to the next one. Aren't these population level data? If so, rely on inferential. Why rely on inferential statistics? And if not population level, how do you account for potential bias in the data? No, this is a great question and one that we have come up with our team and across a lot of different topics to where in statistics, if we have a census, right, we don't really have to think about inferential statistics. However, we often play this game where we think of still there's going to be uncertainty in that census and you can still think about each individual sample draw as a data point from a larger population of draws that could have existed but didn't. So, you know, we do this a lot in a lot of statistical fields to where even if we might have every county in the US, we still treat those counties as if they were a draw from a population of potentially multiple counties, for example. Um, so it is a debate. Some people disagree on the right way to handle this. You know, partly because of the uncertainty with the data, I, I like to treat this as more of an inferential statistics procedure. Right, thank you. What do, you, what do these metrics look like for a negative control, something that would, would most, wouldn't say as a pandemic, for example, RSV or the flu. Are there any undesirable consequences of the t-test framework in your definition? Oh, uh, that's a great question. I have not looked at it yet, so I uh, would love to give a better answer, but we don't know yet. Right, and then the, as Neiman and Pearson wrote about, we can't infer anything in terms of knowledge from a given test. The testing is for decisions. Why is it valid to learn from a learn from or make declarations, not decisions based on these tests? I would say this is a much more philosophical question about the nature of statistics. Um, when I view data and statistics, I tend to think there is information through the window you look into. Now, how much information is there? What you do with it are different questions. I personally believe we do learn from individual tests. Now, yes, sometimes there are gonna be violations of assumptions and that we use asymptotic approximations, right? That's not gonna be perfect. Um, but I personally believe that there is a lot we can learn from this. Uh, I think a much better, more nuanced answer would probably have to wait to a different time, unfortunately. Um, but I, I do think there is something to learn from these statistics. Okay, and then does wastewater sampling allow you to quantify a number of people infected or just a quantity of infection out of the total? Um, to my knowledge, we don't, I should say, I don't know for sure. I want to say no, but I don't know if anyone has put together elaborate disease models linking wastewater to population to try to estimate um, kind of an incidence or prevalence rate from the wastewater samples. Uh, so that's an area where I, I have to say, I don't know if anybody has done that to, to be able to um, estimate the, or quantify the number of people infected from wastewater or not. Okay, and then across individual countries, regions, did you compare declarations of the pandemic end versus when they actually reached the threshold of your t-test? Were there any interesting findings? So the answer is not yet because we've just recently started this, but I think that is a, also a great point because there's still a shortage of research on the impact of the removal of these emergency status um, yeah, declarations. So right, what does it really mean to remove this status? Does it have an impact or is it only a signal of what's happening? You know, for the World Health Organization, they also, cited in their arguments, well, one of the reasons they removed that emergency status is because they wanted to make sure that the emergency status had impact. And if they just leave it forever, people are going to start to ignore it, say, oh, yeah, it's an emergency. We always have an emergency. Um, to my knowledge, this is still an area that is ripe for research in terms of what happens when we abandon these emergency statuses. Um, of course, the way they be, become abandoned does vary because we have different provisions for what they entail by country. Uh, like in the US, we might have certain federal funds that are devoted to certain uh, testing capacity or you know, different kinds of outcomes. 
Um, but, you know, I think that's a great point to look more specifically around the different removals of these and, and see kind of a trend in the t-test. Can you describe the difference between the declaration of the end of the emergency versus the end of the pandemic? So, yes, maybe. It's kind of ambiguous. And this is where we wanted to provide some kind of statistical infrastructure to answer whether the emergency status is the end or not, right? I, I mean, we we have a couple different ends. You know, for us, I think I can speak for us and say, we think of the statistical end as more being this transition from pandemic to endemic to where we've kind of got low level cases. Maybe there's an outbreak here and there, but it's pretty well contained. Um, now, does the emergency status removal coincide with that transition too? Probably not exactly. Um, but as far as we can tell with the World Health Organization, they do seem to coincide pretty closely. Now, the other emergency status is certainly not like in the US or the European U Union. Um, but yeah, th this is where, again, we don't have a definition yet. So we're trying to build in some type of definition uh, that people can run with as well. Okay. All right. And with that, I'm going to close the question and answering and turn it back to Rob. Thanks, Alex. Well, great. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much, Alex. We really uh, uh, love looking at all the different regional variations that uh, you studied um, in particular. Um, but I want to thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Lori, for the questions. I want to thank the audience for joining us and submitting your questions. And the timing worked out just perfect. Uh, and we invite you all to join our next Hibby Institute seminar, which will be in person uh, on Wednesday, October 4th. And we're excited to host Shi Hong Sheng, um, Associate Professor at Harvard Medical School and the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and Epidemiologist at uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital for his presentation, Improve Liver Health Through Inter Interdisciplinary and in Innovative Research. The event will be held in person in the Simpson Quarry Auditorium. Box lunch will be provided and you can register uh, the QR by the QR code here, our newsletter and our social media uh, pages. Again, thank you for joining us uh, today. A recording of the webinar will be available online and will be shared via our newsletter. And this concludes uh, today's webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you.